Well, hello, and welcome to the Growth Mindset Podcast. Join me, Sam Harris, on my journey of curiosity and growth. I have conversations with some of the world's most fascinating humans, from billionaires to Olympians, and most everyone in between, such as suspiciously happy people and even a hitman. Success isn't just for successful people, it is earned and you can earn it too. I find out how ordinary people become extraordinary to fuel your own growth mindset. Well, hello. Today we have Peaches Golding OBE on the podcast. She is the Lord Lieutenant of Bristol which is a very interesting title for a very interesting character. She is first and foremostly just a truly incredible lady who has done some brilliant things with her life, which led to her becoming the Lord Lieutenant of Bristol. In this episode specifically, we discuss the fascinating system in Britain of titles and how you win them. We've had some incredible humans on the show who are sirs and dames or officers of the British Empire. We find out what that means and Peaches teaches me how one might end up receiving such an award from the Queen herself. Now, as Lord Lieutenant, she also organises things like royal visits and has the delightful task of writing to the Queen when occasions require it. So, besides being a fascinating insight into this world, it's also a very motivating lesson into the things that one might need to do to deserve these things, such as title of being a dame, etc., So I think having goals of improving the world are really good and having this lesson from Peaches about like the sort of insights you need to make them happen and just being inspired to like stand up for what you believe in to make a difference was really, really useful. And so I hope that this inspires all of you maybe to raise your own ambitions to do something of value yourself or perhaps to elect someone that you know who is making a difference for the recognition that they deserve. And on that note, let's just crack on with the episode. So I've kind of followed some of the things you've been doing and then saw that you kind of now Lord Lieutenant was like, what the hell does that even mean? <laughs> and <laughs> that's awesome. So I kind of partly wanted to know what that means first and then to kind of backtrack into some of the other things of how you got there and stuff. Okay, very good. Many people do not know what a Lord Lieutenant is. The full term is Her Majesty's Lord Lieutenant. And there are 98 people like me in the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland who are the personal representatives of Her Majesty in our county. So that's really great fun because it Mm. enables us to connect the palaces and 15 or so working royals across five different palaces to our city and also our city back up to those palaces. So what does it mean in practice? It means I do fun things like organize royal visits. So anytime there is a royal visit, there is a Lord Lieutenant behind pulling the strings and making those connections. And some of those can be because the particular royal wishes to come to the area. And others of those are because the Lord Lieutenant asks a member of the royal family to come for a reason. So we also work on the Queen's agenda. And that could be uh, national honors, all those people with three letters or so after their names. We work on those. We are involved in the Queen's Awards for businesses. They're called the Queen's Award for Enterprise, and they come in four different categories. And there's the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service. So we do that. But because Her Majesty has such an enormous impact on our society. We're involved in all sorts of other things. The courts, for example, are the Queen's courts. So any magistrate, and of course magistrates try 95% of cases that come before the law, we're involved in the swearing in of those magistrates. We likewise carry out citizenship services because of the founding of the role, have a military connection. So whenever there's a military parade and you will see on television heads of state and one thing and the next, inspecting the troops and one thing and the next, we get to do that. How cool is that? In churches, we have a specific role because the queen is the head of our Anglican faith. So it's just amazing, actually, Sam, when you think about it. How do you organise a royal visit exactly? Do you send the Queen a letter or what's going on there? There are occasions when I will 
write to Her Majesty and say, ma'am, I think this is really exciting. Don't you? And sometimes you get a letter back saying, yeah, it's very exciting, but guess what? My diary is engaged and I'd love to do it, but sometimes that's the response one gets. And then occasionally one gets a, a message back that says, sure, we'd love to come. And then all the hard work begins. <laughs> but each member of the royal family is an individual and they have different interests and likes. And the skill of it is to identify some activity or or, or, or purpose that aligns with their own interests. What goes into like <laughs> the letters that have got results? How do you craft the letter that ends up with like a, a royal visit? Well, let's start where we are. I guess we have between eight and 12 locations in the city visited by a member of the royal family every year. Mm-hmm. So I'm pretty lucky. I'm pretty fortunate. Sometimes they're on the agenda of, say, the Queen's Awards for Enterprise, because we are the conduit by which a crystal is presented to the winning organization together with a citation. So the presenting of the crystal, the reading of the citation, sometimes works really well if you can encourage a member of the royal family because of their interests to be involved in that. Otherwise, I would do that on my own. There are some important occasions, for example, significant dates of anniversaries. So the 100th anniversary of something only comes around once every hundred years. Mm. And therefore it has a value and an importance that sometimes you can get people to recognize. Then of course there are issues. So if you just think about what the Duchess of Cambridge is doing right now with the Royal the National Portrait Gallery, of which she's a patron, getting us to take photographs of what our lockdown looks like. She also is the patron of a a number of organizations. And if those organizations are located in my county, for example, a visit to that is of interest. So it just depends on, again, being able to understand particular individuals and what their interests are and how that aligns with what's happening here in the county. There's more of having something worthy and not so much about crafting it in a good way in terms of selling it. Is there any tips on like how you write those letters and like things that you don't do and things that you must do and the rules that you get given when you become a Lord Lieutenant or is it just sort of like oh you're the person so you just write the letters and you make it up as you go along yeah there's a bit of that but there's also sorts of important things like you start the letter your royal highness you know so you get your etiquette correct but the most important thing is the sincerity with which that particular letter is written And you do try to keep it to one page of A4. So you need to think about what you want to say and why you want to say it. But members of the public have always been successful in obtaining royal visits for their particular area of interest. And sometimes they do it far better than I could craft the letter. There we go. Thanks. Then, okay, so on the national honours, how does that get worked out exactly? So you get a list suggested to you that people apply? You, member of the public, go on to the Cabinet Office website, download a form that says, I want to nominate this person because of the service they've given to our community. And that community could be anything from, say, sport, education, health, creative, philanthropy, all of the things that are the bedrock of our society. And you write a nomination and you get a couple of people to support you and you provide evidence that describes and defines what that individual has done that's above and beyond and that's how honors come around so i'm always encouraging people to think about those folk that make such a difference in their lives whatever aspect it is it's really important that we recognize people and it's within your gift members of the public Cool. Yeah, I've got a few people in mind that I've been meaning to nominate. I hope you do get around. I mean, a lot of people don't understand the hierarchy within particular orders. And here we're talking about the most excellent order of the British Empire. And so the entry level is the British Empire Medal. And that is like the member of the British Empire. Those two medals are 
for people that do things in their local communities. Then you get the, the officer of the Order of the British Empire, and that's the one I have. And that's for work that's done over a geographical region. And then the next one is a commander, and that's for people that do things on a larger regional national basis. And of course, we all know about sirs and dames, and those are people that do national and international work. So, you know, there's all degrees of award that are made twice yeah. a year. That makes much more sense to me now. <laughs> Glad I asked. That's right. So, yeah. so that wonderful yeah. Captain Sir Tom who mm. walked up and down in his garden. Well, he was made sir because raising 33 million pounds mm. for the National mm. Health Service, you know, that's a national impact. Yeah, definitely. That was huge. Yeah, really love what he's doing. I remember when he first started, I was running a thing called like Thrill Seekers Adventure Club for just doing kind of adventures in your own house because you can't like go on a holiday or do anything silly. But I was like, well, you can kind of do adventures in your own home. And so I started doing things like sort of I did a week of like press up challenges where I did like a challenge like every hour on the hour for a whole week. And that was horrible. Like I only porridge for a week just for like <laughs> differences and make some memories and things. But yeah, he instantly became an honorary member of the club <laughs> because of it. it was like, oh, he's doing cool stuff at home. And then he suddenly becomes famous. I'm like, oh, well, <laughs> you kind of agree with the club. <laughs> anyway, the Queen's Awards. How do they happen anyway? <laughs> Businesses apply for the Queen's Award for Enterprise. And again, there's an application form that's online somewhere in the cabinet office. And they're in four different categories. They're in the category of innovation, does what it says on the tin. You've got a new product that's worthy of that level of recognition because of the numbers of sales that you've made or the difference that it makes to whatever else in the next, you know, you can decide on that one. So there's innovation, there's international trade, again, what it says on the tin, sustainable development. And the last one is called promoting opportunities. And that's all around how it is we get people that are disadvantaged and distant from the workplace into employment. And for that category and for surprisingly sustainable development, we're always looking for more applicants because I think last year there were only seven businesses awarded the Queen's Award for promoting opportunities. And I know there's more work than that going on in the country. Yeah, I was going to say, I know a few people doing cool stuff there. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So each Is one that... has a different set of criteria for international trade might be over a particular time scale. So you might need to have increasing sales for three to five years, for example, whereas innovation might have a shorter time scale. But you've got to be a British owned business and you've got to employ, I think, at least two or three people. So they can really be quite small businesses. And I think about 90 percent almost are indeed SMEs that win these awards. And it's great because you can fly a flag, you put it on your logo, it's very motivational for your staff. You get to meet probably the Prince of Wales these days because they do have uh, a reception at Buckingham Palace pre-COVID. Don't know if they got one in this year before the lockdown. But yeah, it's a tremendous award to receive. Is it kind of a bit like with the ABE, someone else has to nominate or can you just, or is it you apply yourself? For the work that you, you can do. apply yourself yeah you don't need some external person to nominate you and the same goes for the queen's awards for voluntary service mm. again an organization that, that uses the the skills and resources of volunteers and volunteers guide the way that organization works then of course they're eligible for that and they again fill in our form cool okay so how did you win your award I think I was awarded in 2009 for services to minority ethnic communities across the Southwest. And it was in connection with some of the work that I was doing with private sector, public sector organizations to help them make connections in minority communities to increase employment, for example, to increase the promotion of people through those companies, to help them invest in minority community organizations to get more businesses onto their supply chains. So yeah, that was my activity, my mm. service. Back to the question of like, how does one become a Lord Lieutenant? Is it things like that that promote you to being able to be eligible for taking this kind of job? Or is it sort of anyone can apply 
as long as they are a sensible person when they <laughs> appear or do you have to have like the actual background and stuff well it's interesting because her majesty expects between 10 and 15 years of voluntary service from her lord lieutenant so it's quite a commitment not just in time but also in resource so what are the qualities and what is one looking for and how does one become a lord lieutenant is all you know those are very good questions the county determines who their next Lord Lieutenant is. The Privy Council, and I'm sure you've heard of them, they are that body that's comprised of senior MPs and senior members within the households. They conduct a consultation. So a consultation is organized by the Privy Council. They come into the county, they interview a hundred plus people, and they ask two questions. The first question they ask is, hey, what's going on in this area? You know, what's happening in the next 10 years? And you discuss that. And it can be anything from we've got a traffic problem to this is a new development that's being built here or got a university that ex is expanding in a particular way. Or we've got poverty in these communities or education. You know, everything that you would think about that's happening in the county over the next decade. So after that discussion, the second question is asked, and that is, who is best placed to lead the county over that period of time? So names bubble up in that discussion. And the people that contribute to it come from civic and social and military and religious and community and business and all sorts of sectors. So they each will have their views about who is best to lead the county through the next 10 years or so. Three of those names maximum are presented to the prime minister. The prime minister makes a selection and makes a recommendation to Her Majesty. And if Her Majesty is pleased, one is appointed. Do they kind of actually ask you, do you have to put your name forward as someone that might be ready to lead? Or is it more like the Privy Council just sort of look for the people in the area that are active and then they kind of approach you? Well, it all arises from that consultation. So I went to the consultation. I was ready to answer the questions. I had the people in mind that I thought would be good. And having gone through my discussion, I was asked whether my name should be put into the ring. And it was funny because the person conducting it said, how about you? And of course, I'm American. You can tell that by my accent. I thought the question was, and how are you? And so I said, I'm very fine, thank you. And the response came back. That was not the question. The question was, do you want your name to be thrown into the ring? So I said, well, how much time do I have to make a decision? Because, you know, this is monumental. It's just life changing, literally. So I was told I had two weeks to make a decision that would affect the next decade of my life. So I came home and I discussed it with my husband. I discussed it with the children and the extended family and this one, that one and the next and consulted various people that I knew would know what this role is about. And yeah, I, I, I agreed. Well, you got a 30% chance, you know, that's mm. really quite small in life. That's amazing. If you hadn't even thought about it at all, it's like a complete life shift change <laughs> in a pretty radical way. Absolutely. And when you think about it, pre-COVID, I did, what, 12 to 18 events, activities, meetings every week. Wow. That's too many. <laughs> <laughs> it, do, you, do you not feel like you're slightly overstretched and that perhaps you could have like gone for like a part-time Lord Lieutenant instead of like full-time? Yeah, have they ever done job shares? There's not a job share available. Mm -hmm. But what we do yeah. know is that we have to be fairly secure in what it is that our county wants and be able to read that quite well. And in a place like Bristol, we're really a very tiny county mm. and we know each other very well and everything is in touching distance. So it's possibly different from, you know, if you have a large footprint of a county, people less well. But in, in Bristol, we know each other fairly well. We're a city that likes to see its leaders. Definitely. It's been really fascinated with what you've been up to. Well, the pleasure's mine. Thank you for asking me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Not at all. Um, yeah, I'll promote some people that I know about for OBEs and Green Awards because they've done some really cool stuff and um, hopefully become someone worthy of 
getting a <laughs> Queen's Award myself okay. one day. <laughs> it's a good goal to have. I hope you enjoyed the episode as much as I did. My goal for this podcast is to help make people happier and wiser. And I'm also working on a few other projects in the podcasting space to achieve the same thing. I run the Wiser Than Yesterday podcast with a friend where we read and discuss a great non-fiction book a week. Talk about things like philosophy, psychology, the economy, self-improvement and business. Books such as The Black Swan, Anti-Fragile, Invisible Women, How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's a great resource. Most recently, I've been building an app, Syncify. It's really to level up your podcast experience. You can connect with your friends in the app and listen to the same things. So you can listen live in real time with each other or create shared playlists and catch up at your own pace. You learn so much more by discussing ideas with friends. It's really silly to listen alone. You can also discover and share brilliant episodes with ease without having to try and recommend podcasts in different apps and just it all getting lost and confused. So it's also good for combating isolation and mental health. I personally find social media quite antisocial and I just don't find it easy to reach out to friends to chat for no real reason. But I do love doing things with other people and listening to the same content means that I can naturally talk about the same things and it just gives me that friend time without going out of my way. So I really hope that it can help you and I just would love you to try out the beta version and help us build this and obviously do invite your friends. It's all about friends. So you can find out more about Syncify app by going to syncifyapp.com. Thanks for listening. Congratulations on listening to a whole episode of the Growth Mindset Podcast. Before you race into another podcast, try pausing. Ask yourself, what have you learned? What could you change? How will you make that change happen? Did you press pause? Knowledge is useless without action. What did you learn? What should you change? And how will you make that change happen? You can tell us what you learned by contacting us through the website, growthmindsetpodcast.com. And feel free to connect with us or our guests, or just peruse the show notes. Our Instagram is at growthmindsetpodcast, or follow me at samjamsnaps for a daily reminder to stop using Instagram. If you enjoy random acts of kindness and want to support the show, you can support us on Patreon or leave us a review on iTunes and you'll make me very happy. And with that, keep learning and keep growing.